This morning passage from the Acts of the Apostle addresses one of the first challenge of the early church. Who would replace Judah as an apostle? Since Jesus did not leave any instruction to fill this sort of ministerial vacancy, the disciples got together to identify what were their strengths and their weaknesses and what they hoped for in a leader. They compiled all of those in a report. They asked for resumes and statements from those who were interested by the position. And they checked some reference on phone prior to visit a um, prospective candidate in their ministerial context. And finally, they selected one candidate and they asked those who were in full membership to vote. No, 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 don't worry. The first disciple did not follow the United Church of Canada's process because if they did, they probably will still searching. No. The, the disciple established that Judas' replacement must have witnessed the whole life of Jesus, including his resurrection. And then the apostle met in prayer sought God's guidance, and choose a new member by casting lots. That last part might seem odd for us today, but if you follow the news, you know that a member of the provincial parliament in Prince Edward Island was selected that way just last week. So, so Matthias had become an apostle before almost completely disappearing from the rest of the Bible. And this whole story raised the question, why was it so important to replace Judas? Because after all, there's, there were already 11 good disciples remaining. Why should they be absolutely 12 of them? Maybe, just maybe, they felt that they ought to replace Judas in the same way uh, we try to fill the slate of all the vacancies in our church committees. Sometimes we're not quite sure why some committees still exist or what is their mandate, but we surely look for warm bodies to fill them. Churches are very good to create process, regulation, traditions, liturgies, to the, point, to the point we often forget why we are doing something one way and not the other. And often our best answer when we are asked is, that's the way we always have done it. Good example is confirmation. This uh, ritual comes mostly from as the ritual as we know it today, go, comes mostly from a time when everyone belonged to a denomination or the other. It was an affirmation of the identity of a, an individual. You, you, you were Roman Catholic, you were United, you were Methodist. But we don't live in this world anymore. But confirmation is still a big deal in the United Church of Canada because it is linked to full membership. It gives the privilege, singular, only one privilege, to be asked our opinion about every four to five years when a congregation calls a new minister. And that's pretty it. And you will agree with me, that's not very appealing. So I believe we need a different approach, a different frame of reference, a, a different angle to reflect about confirmation. So let's talk about game. Online, online video games, to be more specific. Recently, I discovered the work of Dr. Jane McGonigal who completely completed a PhD at Berkeley University on online gaming. And she collected various researches and, and surveys, and she established that people around the world play on v online video games more than three 
billion hours a week. Not million, three billion hours a week. And through our studies, she came to the conclusion that this amount of time is problematic if we want to solve the problems, the most urgent problems uh, humankind will face during the 21st century, like hunger, climate change, poverty, and obesity. She states, to survive the next century, we should play 21 billion hours a week. And you heard me correctly, Dr. McGonagall advocated not for less, but for more gaining time, 21 billion dollars a week. So, so much for drop this tablet, there's more in life than games, okay? Dr. McGonagall understand that her theory feel totally counterintuitive. And while, however, she firmly believed that gaming can make a better world, McGonagall studied people who played uh, World of Warcraft, the second largest online games in the world. And since its beginning in 1994, it, it, is, it is estimated that people play the equivalent of six million years in World of Warcraft. Six million years is the amount of time that separates us from the time our ancestor learned to stand up. And that's amazing. And this amount of time is possible uh, mostly because youth these days plays on average 10,000 hours by the time they reach 20, 20, 20, 20, 21, sorry, they reach the age of 21. 10,000 hours is a very interesting number because it's about the same amount of time from grade five to high school graduation, if someone has perfect attendance. And these youths spend as much time learning in school than learning through online games. I said learning because according to the theory of Malcolm Gladwell, if one can master 10,000 hours of something by the age of 21, that person would be a virtuoso at it. Right now, we have an entire generation becoming virtuosos as something, but the problem is that most of us are struggling to understand at what. So when we look at online games, we discover that the majority of them are based on immersive epic stories. Gamers feel that are part of an inspiring adventure bigger than themselves, which provide information about why they're there and what they expect to do. Those stories are often complex and they require the gamers to learn uh, as they play with other people from around the world. They are part of a global community that shares common goals. And the good news for us, for, for church people, is the same could be said about the church. Because we are part of an epic story that began way before we joined the church and will continue long after us. In fact, we are part of a global community called the Communion of Saints that share a common inspiring goal, the building of the kingdom of God on earth. And to be successful in our quest, we need partners and partners from around the world. And to achieve our goals, we need to learn from, a, from, from complex stories we find in the Bible. So, so far, this is very good for us. We, as an institution, we have much in common with gamers. Great. Dr. McGonagall study also the concept of epic win. An epic win is an outcome so extraordinarily positive. We had no idea it was even possible before we even act, actually achieve it. It is almost beyond the threshold of our imagination. Online games like World of Warcraft are designed to provide gamers epic wins. These games are very good at understanding the people's real gifts and talent 
and to give them goals just barely above them. Not under, because it would be too easy, but just above, because they need to feel it's achievable if they are ready to be pushed to an edge. And this is why gamers are, real, are ready to fail more than 80% of the time when they're playing, because they know that it, they need to learn to improve in order to get and to achieve an epic win. McGonagall also came to the conclusion that people are the best version of themselves when they are playing online games. If in the real world we're surrounded with anxious, overwhelmed, frustrated, cynical people, online games push us to help other players, to create groups, to collaborate with them if we want to achieve a goal. Gamers have to trust that other players will play by the rules, to sh that they share the same objective and they would make the right decision when time will come. And when facing an obstacle or a problem, gamers are ready to work very hard. They will stick to our problem as long as it takes to solve it. They will give up, get up after failure and try again and again and again because they are convinced they can do something about it and they can do it now. They do not believe that only a few can belong to a dream team. Everyone can belong to that dream team if everybody is ready to make the effort. And when they completed their task, gamers usually do not sit around. They are motivated to work as hard to achieve the next level, which is often translated in their lives as, I'm coming just more, one more level, mom, I'm coming after that. Unfortunately, what the online gaming industry understands so well seems to completely eludes the church, even if it is exactly what we need today. Oh, we like to talk about cooperation between congregation, between denomination, but it does not happen often because it would mean compromise, it would mean, cooperate, would mean sharing, it would mean other people going maybe to another church, and what if they prefer it over there? We do not have the luxury to lose anyone if we want to keep our doors open. We like to talk about trust, but we have come up with countless manuals, handbooks, terms of reference for every thinkable possibility in order to macro-manage the people in their midst. And the result is we're killing every initiative if it does not come through the proper channel. We like to talk about cooperation, oh yes, but we often expect the same five or ten people to be involved and to do everything around our churches. We expect the same people to lead worship, to write the prayers, to usher, to do the coffee. And as for failing, it's not even on our radar. Because for us, failing is bad. It's a loss, it's a setback. We are afraid. We are afraid of trying, especially if it's new. And the result is we became stagnant in our sameness because of our fear of failure. And interestingly, through confirmation, when we look at our youth, we affirm that they already possess gifts, knowledge, expertise in some area, in some thought process, in, in some ways to envision the world that most of us do not have. They already master some of the gifts the church need today, not tomorrow, today, if we want to survive. They have what we lacked. They see failure not as something bad, but as, some, as something, as, as, as a mean of learning, 
to gain experience about what works and don't work, and a necessary step to get to an epic win. They know they can achieve amazing deeds if they get involved personally, hands-on. They have learned to trust people when it's time to make the right choice. They understand that working together is the best means to reach their goals. They know that each of them have the capacity to change and to create a better world. And sometimes when I'm talking to confirmation class, I want to focus on one thing because every, beyond everything what I can tell them, and beyond everything they can learn in this process of confirm the years sometimes they take to get prepared for confirmation, there's something I want to focus and something I like to share. I like to tell them, don't ever change to fit our molds. Teach us how to get outside of them. Because you see, most of us, when we will believe that we cannot do something, I hope those youth will push us to the edge and help us to achieve an epic win. That's why I have so much faith in confirmation. That's why I have so much faith in our youth. Amen.